What a great new song. He knows my name. He knows when every tear falls. He knows my every thought. What a great song. I hope we'll, I think we'll be singing that one again uh, soon. Uh, by the way, if there are any um, buzz counseling experts <laughs> in the congregation, uh, please see us as soon as this service is over. You hear that buzz in the background? We've worked and worked and tried to, tried to find the source of it in Kane. So, uh, of course, in case you hadn't noticed it, I just called your attention to it, uh, <laughs> which wasn't a smart thing to do. Uh, uh, today's message is entitled, Get Out of the Boat. There's a true story that I ran across that tells of a stormy airplane flight aboard a Boeing aircraft, and an off-duty flight attendant happens to be seated next to a man in the grip of serious white-knuckle fear as he watches through his window the aircraft wings bending and bouncing in this uh, stormy weather. This off-duty flight attendant sitting next to him tries to reassure him. She says that, I, you know, I work in the industry. I fly all the time. There's nothing to worry about. The pilots have everything under control. At which the man turns to her and says, Madam, I am an engineer for Boeing, and we did not design this aircraft to do what it is doing. <laughs> uh, that wouldn't be too encouraging if you were the flight attendant, would it? Today, we're going to talk about a man doing what, in one sense, he wasn't designed to do, but in another sense, he was designed to do just that. I'm talking about the Apostle Peter specifically, but in reality, I want to be talking about every one of us gathered in this room today. Last week in the message, I mentioned to you uh, this book by John Ortberg called, If You Want to Walk on Water, You've Got to Get Out of the Boat. I want to mention it again and strongly encourage you to buy a copy, especially during this time in which we as a congregation uh, have, have embarked upon a self-study and setting some goals for the future. This would be a great book for each of you to read. I have an autographed copy here, and when John autographed it for me, he told me that for every book I would sell, I'd get a dollar back. No, that's not true, but, <laughs> uh, but I do want you to uh, seriously consider, I think you could find it at Lifeway, probably at Heaven and Earth. It's a great book, and much of which I want to share with you in today's message, the thoughts uh, originated or out of the first chapter of this book, so maybe that'll be an, an appetizer for you. So let's look at today's text found in Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14 is a rather long passage that I want us to read, starting with verse 22. Uh, Matthew records, Immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went upon a mountainside by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. During the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. That's where it gets interesting, isn't it? Walking on the water. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, Tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. John Orberg writes, Peter may have been the first one out of the boat, but Jesus' invitation to walk on water is for you as well. That's where you'll meet him, out where the sea is high and the footing is impossible. End of quote. But the question then is this, this morning is, what does Orberg mean by walking on the, on the water? Does he literally mean that we should go out to the Atlantic Ocean and attempt to walk across the surface of the ocean? Well, no, he tells us, in, the, in fact, in the uh, flyleaf of the, of the book, he says, 
uh, walking on water means facing your fears and choosing not to have fear, let the, uh, have the last word. Discovering and embracing the unique calling of God on your life is walking on the water. Or experiencing the power of God in your life to do something you would not be capable of doing on your own. And when I read that particular sentence, it really struck a chord with me since we've been talking about the power of Christ in you. You know, it's one thing for us to last Sunday talk about resurrection power and, and what it can do in us. Well, this is a good follow-up to that message. Experiencing the power of God in your life to do something you would not be capable of doing on your own. How did Peter walk on the water? Through any power of his? Absolutely not. Jesus enabled him, Jesus empowered him to do that miraculous thing, even if though in just a few moments or a few seconds probably, uh, Peter's faith failed him. And so today, I want us to take a brief look at some of the details of this story that we've just read from Matthew uh, chapter 14 in order to see what, what goes into the making of a water walker. Uh, that may be a u- new expression, but uh, let's refer- think of ourselves as water walkers this morning. What, what would happen? What needs to go into uh, ourselves, into our lives, into our hearts and minds in order to make us a water walker? And so uh, let's look at this particular account. Number one, water walkers recognize God's presence. Water walkers recognize the presence of God. Now, back in our text, we read in verse 24 that the boat in which the disciples were found was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Now, keep in mind, at least some of those guys in the boat were seasoned watermen. They'd been on the, I mean, they were fishermen. They had spent their adult life and perhaps some of their teen uh, years uh, out on the lake and, and no doubt were very experienced as to when storms came up. But this was not a minor squall. It says the boat was being buffeted by the waves. I suspect that they, although accustomed to bad storms, were a little bit at this point concerned for their life, concerned for their safety in the midst of this storm. And then... Matthew says they saw Jesus, but they didn't recognize him. Now, Mark's account, Matthew and Mark, and uh, uh, I, I almost believe all four Gospels record this incident, but Mark's account says that he was about to pass them by. He was about to pass by them. Now, you know, we scratch our heads and wonder about that until we do a little research and find out that the verb translated to pass by. Now hang on to what I'm saying here. The verb to pass by is used in the Greek translation of the Old Testament as a technical term to refer to a, this may be a new expression for you, a theophany. Uh, I'll put it on the screen, a theophany. Now what is it? You say, what's a theophany? A, a, A theophany is when God made striking and temporary appearances in the earthly realm here on earth to a select individual or group for the purpose of communicating a specific message. Now, did you catch all of that? That's called a theophany. Now, to help us grasp it a little bit more, let's look at some examples of theophanies in the Old Testament. For example, you remember God on top of Mount Sinai put Moses in the cleft uh, cleft of a rock. Why? Because he said, I'm getting ready to pass by. Do you remember that passage? And so uh, that was a theophany. God was making a special appearance to a specific individual for a specific purpose. Or you remember God told Elijah to stand on the mountain for the Lord is about to pass by, he said. Now, there are more of these examples, but it's important that we see a pattern in all of this that applies to the apostles, I think, in the boat. In each case, God had to get the person or people's attention maybe through a burning bush with Moses, uh, wind and fire with Elijah, or walking on the water with the apostles. In each situation, God was grabbing their attention in a very special way, calling them to do something extraordinary, and in each situation, it's noteworthy that the person to whom God made his appearance felt fear. 
Uh, when Moses saw uh, or heard God in, uh, in the burning bush, he was frightful. Elijah, the same thing. Um, uh, each of these individuals that we're, that we're talking about. But every time that people said yes to whatever it was that God called them to do, they experienced the power of God in their lives. I hope you're following with me. So I want to ask you as an individual, this is a very thought-provoking question. If you could, would you like to experience a theophany in your life? I mean, think about that for a moment. Would you like to have such an experience in your life? I think it's a pretty tough question. Because, you know, maybe the first temptation is, oh, yeah, yeah, man, wouldn't that be great? Walk on water, see a burning bush that doesn't burn up, you know? Have God pass me by. But if you say yes to that, it would most likely mean, first of all, fear. I'm not just talking about a little fright. I'm talking about extraordinary alarm, fear. And then it would also mean that God was calling you to be used in some extraordinary fashion in his kingdom. And so when I ask you that question, would you like to experience a theophany? It's a thought-provoking question, and you don't have to answer right now. Okay, we'll poll you later. <laughs> but notice that Jesus came to them in this theophany. Um, notice also, we, as we look at this text, that Jesus comes when least expected. I mean, 3 a.m. in the middle of a storm. That's not when you expect to see Jesus. Uh, notice something else. Twelve disciples sat in this boat, and we really don't know how 11 of them responded. Perhaps with wonder, confusion, dazed, disbelief, a little bit of each of those and more. But we know that one of them, Peter, was about to become a water walker. Why? Because he recognized that God was present. He says, Jesus, is that you? Is that you? And if it's you, then let me come to you. I asked the question a moment ago to you as individuals. Let me ask this question. If, as a member of the Avalon congregation, would you like for Avalon to be known as a water-walking congregation? Think about that. I would. And what I mean by that is that I would desire that collectively we become a family of believers who are able to, A, sense God always in our presence, who have fear but overcome our fears because God is present, and who say, and this is the most important part of it, who, who say, God, we're willing to be used of you in whatever way you see fit to use us. Whatever you want us to be as a congregation, we're willing to be that. We're willing to go through fear in order to accomplish that. We're willing to stretch, be stretched in our faith. We're willing to step out whatever the risks are in order to become the kind of church that you would have us to be. Wouldn't you like to be that kind of congregation? Now, if that's going to happen, then we need to look at and respond to point number two on your right line. The second thing that we see in the story is that water walkers get out of the boat. <laughs> water, that seems pretty obvious, but sometimes it's missed. This is one of those, I think this is one of those Bible accounts that, you know what it is in your own Bible reading that sometimes you, you read a passage of Scripture, and especially if it's maybe in one of the Gospels, and you read this account and you say, wow, that was awesome. And you just keep going. And, and you really don't stop and take time to dwell on it. I think this is one of those kinds that, you, that you're tempted to just say, wow, Peter walked on the water, but shame on him, he sank. And, and then you just keep going, what's next, Matthew? What's next, Luke? Well, this is one of those accounts I think that should bring a second look. When this story is read or related or preached on, let me ask you, where is the emphasis usually placed on this story? Isn't it on the lack of faith that caused Peter to sink? I plead guilty as a preacher. I've preached sermons on Peter's lack of faith that caused him to sink. I feel guilty about doing that right now. I, why? Because I think if that's our main emphasis, we've missed the point. We missed the major point of this. I mean, isn't it great that James and John were not reprimanded by Jesus for their lack of faith? Isn't it great that Thomas wasn't reprimanded for his lack of faith? Well, no, it's not. It's not great that they were not reprimanded. 
You see, Peter was the only one out of the twelve who got out of the boat. That's the main point. Peter got out of the boat. You see, people who never get out of the boat never sink. Did you realize that? They live lives that are safe, very comfortable, very secure. Did Peter fail? Well, in a way he did. It, but his faith was strong, but not strong enough. His diets were stronger. He sank, so he failed. But there were, get this, there were 11 bigger failures sitting in the boat, weren't there? They failed quietly. They failed privately. Their failure went unnoticed. They didn't receive much criticism. Only Peter knew the shame of public failure. And you know, when you really stop and think about it, Peter was not unused to that. In fact, most of Peter's ministry during the three years of Jesus' ministry here on earth was a, uh, uh, just a catalog of failures. If you really stop and think about it, seeing something he shouldn't say that prompted Jesus to say, Satan, get behind me. Uh, not saying things that he should say. Like, for example, when he was around the fire in the courtyard, he should have owned up to being a follower of Jesus, doing things that he shouldn't have done, for like, like cutting the servant's ear off in the, in the garden of Gethsemane. I mean, Peter had a pretty long list of failures. But do you remember Acts chapter 2? We've dwelt on Acts chapter 2 a lot in, in past sermons since the first of years, the story of the beginning of the church, the uh, outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the apostles. Remember Acts 2.14 where it says, Then Matthew stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Remember, remember that passage? Anybody remember that passage? Come on now, are you awake? It says, Then Matthew stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. No, no I, I messed it up. It says, Then Thomas stood up with the eleven. Then some of you are shaking your head no. Uh, I, let me try again. Then James stood up with the eleven. What does it say? Peter, the failure. Peter, the failure. I, out, of, out of all the... Isn't it, isn't it no word that... I mean, doesn't it strike you as very interesting that Peter, with his long list of failures, was the one guy that God prompts. Luke is inspired by the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 2, he says, Peter stood up. Why? I think because Peter stood out, even though he, he failed so many times... Peter was the individual who, in faith, said, Jesus, if that's you, I want to walk on the water. He wasn't a failure nearly as much as the other guys in the boat. Are you with me? You ha if you're going to walk on the water, you've got to get out of the boat. And let's go back to the story here in, in Matthew 14. While it was only Peter who knew the shame of public failure, it was only Peter, get this, it was only Peter who knew two other things as well, and probably more. But think about this. Out of all the twelve, only Peter knew the euphoria of walking on water. If I could say to you this morning, out of this entire congregation of people in this service, and in the second service too, that I'm going to pick one person and you're going to walk on water. Would I have any volunteers? How many would volunteer? Raise your hand. I would. I'd say, Yeah. Man, that would be awesome to walk on water. Peter's the only one I know, other than Jesus, who's ever had the euphoria of walking on the water. Wow. That's pretty neat. And uh, secondly, only Peter knew the glory of being lifted up by Jesus in that moment of desperate need as he was sinking into the stormy waters. Andrew was never able in later, in later life to say, Hey guys, let me tell you what it felt like when I was, when I was going down and I, all of a sudden I felt the hand of Jesus and he lifted me up. Thomas could never tell that to his family or to his friends. Andrew could never share the euphoria of that moment, the glory of that moment. Peter shared a moment with Jesus that none of the others ever shared. I don't know about you, but that, that excites me. And I think, Peter, you weren't such a jerk after all. I mean, I really admire you for getting out of the boat. And so I want to ask you this morning, wh wh what's your boat? 
What's your boat? He said, what do you mean, what's my boat? Your boat is whatever represents safety and security to you apart from God himself. Do you get that? I mean, when life gets a little stormy, and it does get that way for us all, in what do you place your trust? Your, your boat may be your work. Your boat could be a relationship. Your, your boat could be uh, your family. Your boat could be fear of change. I, you know, there are a lot of people who go through life never changing anything. That's their boat. That's their security. That's their safety. Uh, your boat may be uh, a besetting sin that you just won't turn loose off. You, you're not willing to step out in faith and rid yourself, rid your life of that sin. A good Bible example of a man in a boat is found in Luke 18, where you remember this account well, I'm sure, where a rich ruler came to Jesus, only to hear Jesus say to him, you still lack one thing, sell everything you have and give to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven, then come follow me. You see, Jesus knew that that man wasn't in a boat, he was in a yacht. <laughs> it was a huge boat, it was a fancy boat, it was a rich boat. And he said, you want to follow me, you've got to step out of the boat. And, and he didn't, because verse 23 says, when he heard this, he became very sad because he was a man of great wealth. You see, this man decided not to get out of the boat. Why? Because he had a very nice boat, and he liked it too well to give it up. You see, there are many, many people in our culture and society today who have followed in that young ruler's footsteps, and who, when they get to the end of this life and they look at their bank account and their stock portfolio, no doubt will wonder what life would have been like had they, take Jesus, had they taken Jesus at his word and risked the whole thing for one wild bet on the kingdom of God. Now, your, your, your boat may not be your stocks or your wealth, but every one of us has some kind of boat. And the question is, are we willing to step out of it? Because you'd never sink if you never get out of the boat. And then there's a third thing that I want us to see in this passage, and that is that water walking brings a deeper connection with God. Water walking brings a deeper connection with God or a deeper relationship with God. Uh, I won't date you. I, I apologize ahead of time. But how many of you remember when doctors used to make house calls? Raise your hand. Okay, not many, I do, not many of us left. Did you notice that? <laughs> that goes back quite a few years, doesn't it? When doctors used to, some of you younger people are saying, what? Yeah, yeah, they really did. They used to. They'd come to your house. Well, I, um, I read of a cold, rainy night when the telephone rang in the home of this doctor. And the caller identified himself and said that his wife was in need of urgent medical attention. The doctor was very understanding, said he was willing to come, attend to her needs. But then he explained to the, to the man that uh, his car was in the shop getting repaired, and he had no way of getting there. And he asked the husband if he'd come and get him. The man angrily responded. He said, what, in this weather? And hung up. <laughs> yeah. You see, folks, that's, the reason I tell that is that's often our problem with God. It really is. We want a close connection that will have him as a, uh, a house-calling God available when we need him, but only during those times, and not if it means we have to make an effort to, to make that connection and that relationship closer. As you know, I frequently refer to the surveys and studies of George Barna, the Christian pollster, a recent email update that I got revealed a very disturbing trend among Christians. The email began this way. It said, more than 7 out of 10 Americans, that is 72%, notice how he put it, claim that they've made a personal commitment to Jesus Christ that is important in their life. But a survey examining some of the other commitments that those same 72% of the people make and avoid suggests that people are totally inconsistent in their spiritual perspectives. For example, and I think I put this on your outline, fewer than 20%, that's out of the 72% who say, we have made a personal commitment to Christ. Fewer than 20% firmly believe that a congregational church is a critical element in their spiritual growth. Are you following me on this? 
72% of people said, oh, I have, made a, I have made a personal commitment to Jesus Christ. Church, mm, less than 20% said having a firm attachment, involvement in a local church really meant a lot to them. Just as few strongly contend that participation in some type of community of faith, that is church, is required for them to achieve their full potential. Only 17%, the third bullet on your right line, only 17% of adults said that a person's faith is meant to be developed mainly by involvement in a local church. Folks, that is staggering because it is so staggering in that it reveals either A, a startling ignorance of the role of the local church that's taught in the Bible, that's taught in God's Word, or B, an unhealthy disregard of what the Bible actually has to say. If those statistics reflect where some of you may stand, I, don't, I hope not, but if they do, where you may stand in relationship to God through the local church, let me encourage you, if you don't hear anything else I've said today, let me encourage you with all of my being to, to get your Bible out, read carefully, and reevaluate what you're getting about what the Bible says about you and a local congregation. Listen to me. The Bible knows absolutely nothing about solitary Christianity. If you're one of those individuals who says, I have made a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, and now for the rest of my life it's just Jesus and me, you are so totally off track. It's, it's not even funny. When the church had its beginning, you remember, 3,000 people gave their hearts and lives to Jesus. And nowhere is there ever even a hint that, e that even one of them struck out on his or her own in a daily walk with the Lord. Contrary to that, Luke records in Acts 2.44, all the believers were, what's that word? All the believers were together, together, and had everything in common. Then that theme of togetherness is continually woven throughout the rest of the New Testament, throughout the rest of the book of Acts, throughout all of the epistles. In fact, these epistles, Corinthians and Galatians and Ephesians and James and Peter and Hebrews and all of those, uh, the major part of the New Testament is written or, or was written to, to tell us how as individuals we can grow closer to God, how by working together within a congregational atmosphere within a community of believers. And I wonder sometimes if people are reluctant to get more involved in the life of the local congregation because there's a risk involved. You say, Jimmy, what does all this have to do with getting out of the boat? A lot. A lot. Because it was a tremendous risk for Peter to step out of that boat onto the water when Jesus bid him come. And there is a tremendous risk for you and for me to step out of the, the, uh, the shelter of our own individual life and say, in a local church, count me in. I want to be involved. So involved in what? Involved in the lives of other people. Because that's what community is. It's where I take the risk. You might hurt me. <laughs> it happens. You may disappoint me. You may discourage me. It's a risk. But Jesus says, get out of the water. And, and I wonder sometimes if when we, we plead for people to get involved in all different aspects, is, a, you know, is, is the risk too much? If, if you invite someone to come to church with you, <laughs> there are so many risks involved in that. The person invited may say no, and you may be embarrassed. Oh, horrors. <laughs> you know? Could you stand that? The one you invited may come with you and not like it and say, I'm not coming back anymore. That's a risk. The person you ask to come may come, become a Christian, and not grow you spiritually. That's a risk. <laughs> Certainly wouldn't want that to happen, would we? The risk. If you were to tell Jerry, Jerry, count on me to help in the nursery, guess what? There are risks involved. A baby might throw up all over you. <laughs> what a risk. 
A hard-to-please parent might get upset at you for some invalid reason the Sunday that you keep the nursery. The person who is scheduled to help you may not show up. You get stuck with the infant nursery all by yourself. Yeah. There's all kinds of risk involved. Or, or the baby boy you take care of may grow up to become the next Bob Russell of the restoration movement. Wow, wouldn't that be great? If you as a young person listening carefully and intently to the messages every Sunday, if you do that, there's a risk. God may call you into ministry and send you to Africa as a missionary if you're willing to get out of the boat. Or you may figure out that the way God wants to use you is a preacher which contains some risk for the future. If you decide that by being part of a small group, which we feel like everybody ought to be in a small group, you can add more to the value of other Christ followers' lives by being there for encouragement and support, but there's always a risk. You could get hurt. You could get out of the boat. I mean, this is really getting out of the boat and volunteer to teach a Sunday school class, but you never know what might happen. The class may not be very easy to teach, and you have to spend hours and hours every week in order to get well prepared, prepared enough to hold their interest. But one day you may get a card in the mail that says, Thank you. For giving to the Lord, I'm a life that was changed in your class. Thank you for giving to the Lord. I'm so glad you gave. You see, there's, there are rewards as well as risk. As we prepare to close today, my question to each one of you is, in relationship to the boat, where are you? Where are you? Huddled in the boat with a life preserver and a seat belt on? <laughs> Pretty comfortable. Maybe one leg in, one leg out. <laughs> undecided. Do I want to do this or not? Maybe you're already walking on the water and loving every moment of it. That is, life is such an adventure because you don't know where the Lord will call you next, but you're ready to go. And you're saying, whatever it is, God, wherever you want me, whatever you want me to do, whatever you want me to say, just let me know. Open the door, open the window, and I'm ready to go through. Life is exciting. It's adventuresome. You may be out of the boat, and right now the wind's looking pretty bad. And the waves are pretty high. But you're assured that Christ's hand of support is holding you up. Or if you fail and sink, he'll pull you back to safety, just like he pulled Peter back. Today, as we prepare to sing, I was thinking about this at the beginning of the message. You know, we were, we were created by God in one way, not to walk on water. In other words, it's not a natural thing, is it? Uh, if you saw me go out, if we adjourned here and went out to the beach, and I said, watch this, folks, and I walked across the surface of the Atlantic Ocean, you'd, you'd be awestricken because we're not designed to do that. But in another way, we are created and designed by God to be water walkers. That is to have that resurrection power in us to launch out no matter what the risks are and to accomplish tremendous things for him. And so if you're here today as a Christian, and most of you are, as we sing this closing song, could I just challenge you to say, God, I, I, you may stutter and stumble over it a bit, but if you could get it out, while we're singing this closing song, just say, God, I, I want to be a water walker. I really do. So fill me with that kind of faith that caused Peter to step out of the boat. And if you're here and not a Christian, then the first step is to take that initial step of faith and give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ in total surrender, to confess your faith in Him, to be buried with Him in the waters of Christian baptism. The Bible says that we need to do that in obedience to Jesus Christ in order to have our sins forgiven. So if you have a decision to make for Christ, we invite you to come as we stand and as we sing our closing song together.